good, good to be here this morning. And we're going to begin this morning uh, with our meditation verse, and followed by a prelude. Um, so let's hear God's word from Revelation chapter 7. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and honor and wisdom and thanksgiving and, and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. I want to welcome you all this morning to the worship of our Lord, our God, and our Savior. Our call to worship is taken from Colossians chapter 3. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanks thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's join together in a hymn of worship that all things now living from the Red Hymnal, Trinity Hymnal num number 125. Stand and sing.
Our God and our Savior, we praise you and thank you so much for your salvation through Christ our Lord. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the resurrection. We thank you that, Lord, you now reign in heaven and over earth and in the earth, for you are God and you are our Savior. You are risen and you are coming again. Lord, we praise you and thank you. And we come to you now and are reminded of the wonders of your creation, that you rule in all things. We can trust and rest in you and your care for us. We praise you as we come. We would worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in spirit and in truth. So we ask for your help and your grace in this hour. Help us in our worship to keep our hearts and thoughts and minds drawn toward you and that we as we enter your presence by faith lord may we worship you in spirit and in truth for we ask this in the name of jesus amen thank you please be seated <clears throat> As we continue through the Psalms in our Old Testament readings, we are now at Psalm 116. So let's read responsively God's word. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. Return, O my soul, to your rest. For the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord from the land of the I believed, even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. O oh Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise, praise the Lord. Now our call to confession. Is taken from Luke chapter 15, verse 7. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Let's come to God in a prayer of confession. Oh Lord, we, we come before you, the Holy One, the creator of all, the one to whom we owe our life and our being, our very breath that we breathe. Lord, we praise and thank you that you have not dealt with us according to our works. We thank you that you have dealt with us according to your own mercy and grace through Jesus and his cross. 
Lord, we come to you not as those who are righteous. There is no good thing in us. You alone are holy. You alone are righteous. And Lord, we are all together born in sin. <clears throat> and Lord, we confess that in the weakness of our sin, we have allowed ourselves to be led away from you. We have allowed ourselves to be taken in with the currents of this world and the ways of this world and the thinking of this world. There have been too many times when we have simply forgotten about you and gone about our life as if you were not there present with us and holding our very life in your hands. Lord, we thank you for your mercies. And Lord, we pray that you would forgive us our sins for the way we have not loved you with all that we are. And we have not loved our neighbor. We have not loved one another as you have loved us in Jesus. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for our self-centeredness, our pride, our sinful desires, our going after the, the pleasures of this world. Lord, our, just our protection of our own good name and, and not being ready and willing to own what we are before you and, and come before one another in all humility and Lord, we pray that you would forgive us and cleanse us and heal us through the cross of Jesus. We thank you that we belong to him by faith through your covenant in him. And we ask your blessing now as we come to you. Help us in our weakness. Help us to worship you. Help us to draw close to you in the confidence that Jesus is enough and more. We pray in his name. Amen. Let's join together in singing. Teach me thy way, O Lord. It comes from the Trinity hymnal number 606. Let's stand and sing.
Please be seated. Our New Testament reading is taken from Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Now let's uh, come to God in a prayer of thanksgiving and intercession. We sent out a, a prayer request for the Zier family and just wanted to let you know that uh, Kathy has improved a great deal, um, Martha's sister, and they're hoping and expecting that she'll be coming home perhaps even today. And we're thankful for answered prayer there. And we also will be praying um, for Rusty as he has gone into uh, hospice care. So let's uh, come to God in, in prayer. Father, we do thank and praise you for your mercies. We praise you. You are the Holy One and you have made a way for sinners to be forgiven and cleansed and to be received by you into your presence. And by faith, we, we come to you for you have called us into your presence. We ask that you will help us in our weakness, help us to trust and believe as we come to you and pray. Lord, we do pray for those in our church family who are struggling with the fight against cancer, and we ask that you would strengthen their bodies and their soul and spirit and grant them health and healing from this cancer. We pray for your blessing on those who are unable to be with us uh, due to health and age, and we ask that you would be with them and encourage and strengthen them and be just close to them. And Lord, we ask that you would comfort and help them. We do pray for the, the Sipes family and ask that you would comfort and help them, bless them, particularly as Terry's brother is entering into hospice. And we ask that you will Grant him your peace and, and grace that he would trust in you, especially in these days. We also pray for other members of the family as they are struggling to over health issues and one over cancer and pray that you would bring healing there as well. Lord, we pray for your blessing on our country, on our officials, we pray for you to preserve the, the freedoms we enjoy to proclaim your name and worship you freely as a people. We pray for justice. We pray that you would grant us justice uh, judges who would uh, be true in their judgments, who would be faithful according to your law and your truth. We pray, Lord, for your blessing. 
We also pray, Father, for your, your, those who serve in missions. We thank you for Matt and Ellen and ask that you would bless them and their work here in the States as they're working with Equip Ministries and pray that you would continue to protect them. And we pray for those whom they serve with so many years, the people of Honduras who have been hit by this hurricane, and pray that you would provide for their needs, especially at this time. And we pray that you would also provide for uh, this epidemic, this pandemic, and bring uh, healing through a vaccine and through treatment and relief that the people there in Honduras and in other places, and including our own country, that we might uh, have the more freedom to uh, be uh, gathering together and worshiping you and growing in you, and that you might build and have mercy on us and on our country. Lord, we pray your blessing on those who serve here in um, health care and especially in the um, assisted living and, and nursing homes, but also in the hospitals as there are many who are struggling um, with not only COVID, this COVID-19 disease, but other health concerns. And it's just being, being very difficult. We ask for your mercies. We thank you for those who serve and we pray your blessing on them and blessing on those who are in the hospital that you would be with them and then restore them, especially those, Lord, who know you. Thank you again for your grace in our home, in our families, and in our church, in our community, in our country. Lord, you bless us beyond all that we deserve. We thank and praise you, and we ask that you would have mercy. We praise you that you continue to rule in all things, and we can trust you and that we know that you are bringing these things um, for our good. We can trust you in this. We thank you and praise you. And we ask your blessing now as we continue to worship you, for we praise you through Jesus. Amen. Let's join together now in singing the doc doxology. Let's stand and sing as we prepare for God's word. continue to sing that doxology has been sung for centuries now by God's people. We are a continuing church. God is saving a people for himself, to, for his own glory. This morning we are coming to Matthew chapter 5 verses 17 through 20. Have you ever noticed how there are times when you think, think that you need one thing, but what you really need is something else? You know, when we are, are or were <laughs> young adults and single, we think that the emptiness and loneliness of our lives will be filled if we get married. We think if we got married to someone we loved, well then, then we'd be happy. So, we look for that one, we find that one we love, and we get married. Often by the time we get married, we begin to see that our partner is not quite perfect. <laughs> that he or she has some shortcomings and weaknesses. 
But we think that either it is not a big deal or it is something getting married will help fix. After all, we love one another. What more can, can you want? And there it is. We are really getting married for love. We have found love and getting married will only make it better. Will only make it more complete. But after a few years of marriage, it begins to dawn on you that there are some problems that are not insignificant. They are big. You thought that you knew this person you were marrying. and You find that you really did not know or understand him or her well at all. <clears throat> and married life is not re really not what you thought it would be. And here the truth about marriage begins and, and love begins to emerge. It is, it is not that <clears throat> your marriage was great and is now broken. Rather, there was a lot of brokenness that is only now beginning to be revealed. <clears throat> marriage is, is like being given your dream house. A dream house you've never gone to yet. <laughs> you're handed the deed and you're all excited about your new home. And now you, you go to live there for the first time and you find, well, that it, it's all there. The windows, the doors, the shingles, the siding, the lumber, the wiring, the pipes, it's all there and waiting for you to build it. <laughs> and second, you find that building your marriage is not so much about fixing your partner as it is about fixing yourself. You thought you got married because you found love. Love was your dream house. Only the love you found was mostly the feeling of love. The truth about marriage is not that you have found that special love, the love that makes two become one, but that you must build that love, that special love. And what's more, that building that love is not about changing your spouse so much as it is about changing yourself. Love and marriage are not what you thought they would be. And you remember how you once thought that what you needed most to be happy was to get married. <clears throat> but now that you are married, you find that get, getting married was not it. Now you are beginning to realize that what you really need and what you needed all along was to become a less self-centered and a more loving person. The Jews also thought that they knew what they needed. They were sure that they knew what they needed. They could prove that from scriptures. They needed the righteousness of the law. Time and time again, God says in the Old Testament that he will bless the righteous, that he rewards the righteous, that he saves and protects the righteous, shows favor to the righteous, and loves the righteous. You need righteousness. The Jews thought they understood what this righteousness was like and how you could get it. They thought they understood what the law taught about the righteousness that we all need. Only they did not. They did not understand what true righteousness looks like. Jesus showed them what it looks like. And he taught them what they needed to do to get it because they did not have it. The problem was that the Jews did not know or understand the scriptures, that is, the law and the prophets. And so when Jesus lived out God's truth and taught God's truth, it seemed to them 
that he was overturning and even rejecting the word of God. And this was the situation that led Jesus to say what he did in this morning's text. So let's read God's word. Matthew chapter, seven, uh, chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. <clears throat> Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for coming to the earth and, and speaking the truth in ways that you, you demonstrated by your life. That through your life and through your teaching, your word, the very word of God, we might know the truth. The truth about righteousness. The truth about your law. The truth about your salvation. And the truth about ourselves. Lord, help us as we come to your word. Bless your word. May you be exalted. May we see you and your salvation in a more clear and bright light. We pray this through your name. Amen. Matthew's gospel was written for the Jews, for those who were confident that they had the true religion. Indeed, the, they did. That true religion was revealed in God's word in the law of God. And according to the law, the worship of God required that they offer sacrifices. The Jews served and maintained the worship and religion of God, and they did so by offering the sacrifices required in the law. And this became a problem for them because they connected their righteousness before God with the sacrifices that they offered in worship. Isn't our worship, that moment when we come to God in truth, right? To worship him. Isn't that our righteousness? They thought so. And so the sacrifices that they offered represented their worship. And naturally, the worship they offered represented their righteousness. But they had it all wrong. And in Matthew's Gospel, we find Jesus, Jesus explaining this to them. He says to them in Matthew 9.13, and again, in Matthew 12, verse 7, he said, Learn what this means. I desire mer mercy, not sacrifice. Because true righteousness is found only in a heart where there is love, in a heart where God's love fills the heart. 
The Jews needed to understand this because Jesus, through the sacrifice of himself for our sins, was about to bring an end to all animal sacrifices. Because they all had been pointing to his one true sacrifice. It would soon appear to the Jews that the gospel of Jesus Christ was overturning the law because the cross of Jesus meant that animal sac sacrifices were no longer needed in the worship of God. In fact, the temple in Jerusalem was no longer needed. And to the Jews, this was an outrage and blasphemy. Yet, this was one way in which Jesus came to fulfill the law. The sacrifices and even the temple itself were all types that pointed to Christ, to the one who was the true temple of God, and also the true sacrifice for sins, and remain so today. Jesus also fulfills all the prophecies concerning the Messiah, concerning his birth, life, death, resurrection, and return in glory. As Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, for all the promises of God are yes in him. And for this reason, Jesus said in verse 18, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Because all that is written about him in the law and the prophets will be fulfilled in him. What is written in the law and prophets is not only fulfilled in him, but also by him. By the life he lived, Jesus fulfilled all that is required of a man in the law. He kept the law perfectly. Throughout his life, and especially at the cross, he loved his Father with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength, and he loved his neighbor as himself. Repeatedly, we read in the New Testament that he was without sin. We find that in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, 1 John 3, 5, and 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 22. And repeatedly, he is called the righteous one. Isaiah 51, 53, 11, Acts 7, 52, and 1 John 2, verse 1. He fulfilled the righteousness of the law and prophets by his life. And Jesus also fulfilled the law by his death. Because in dying for our sins, he took our place and fulfilled all that the law requires be done to those who break God's law. Jesus did not come to abolish the law and the prophets. He came to fulfill them by his life and by his death. Finally, what is written in the law and the prophets is being fulfilled through him. Fulfilled in him, by him, and through him. To understand how Jesus is doing this, we need to go back to the beginning to creation. God created us in his own image. We were created to be like him. Especially in the way God loves. As Jesus revealed in the sacrifice of himself on the cross for our sins, God is love. 
the righteousness of God, which is found also in the righteousness of the law, is really an expression of love. We were created to be like God in love, in the way we are to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and the way we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. But the lies of the devil and the sin of Adam and Eve ruined all that. Now instead of loving God by putting him first and living for his glory, we have inherited a sinful nature and we live for our own glory and we put ourselves first. And the law of God cannot change what is in our hearts. The law cannot make us loving by nature and restore the glory of God's image in us. The law can only reveal what is already there in our hearts. What is there is a deep brokenness. What is there is sin and guilt and shame. But through Jesus, God does what the law cannot do. This is just what Romans 8, verses 3 through 4 says, where we read, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The work of God's salvation through Jesus Christ is the work of restoring God's own image in us so that we would love as Christ loves and so that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. But it is not through our own power, our own flesh nature, or our own works. It is all through the work of Christ's redemption and through the power of the Holy Spirit Through Christ and the power of the Spirit, we are born again, made a new creation, forgiven and cleansed of our sins, justified before God with the righteousness of Christ, and now we are being sanctified. God does this all by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. The new covenant does not relax the requirements of the law, just as our text says. The new covenant fulfills the requirements of the law in us so that we are becoming more loving and more righteous as we learn to walk according to the Spirit who dwells in us. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. And as we come to bear this fruit, we begin to fulfill the righteousness revealed in the law and in the prophets. And none of the credit and glory is ours. It all belongs to Jesus Christ. We are justified and counted perfectly righteous before God because we are in Christ and one with Christ. We are being sanctified and being delivered from the power of sin so that we can live for God because we are in Christ and one with Christ. And one day when Christ returns, we will be glorified with a righteous nature and body just like Christ's righteous nature and body because we are in Christ and one with Christ. And why? 
Because God, Jesus, Jesus saves this completely, this perfectly. And by God's grace, we believe. Now, this sounds wonderful, and it is wonderful. But often, it does not seem or feel as wonderful as it truly is. And that is because while we live in this flesh, we must do what Jesus tells us to do to make any progress in our sanctification. We must take up our cross and follow him. By faith, we need to join ourselves with Christ in his death. And through the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the flesh. And that's not something we like to do. But this is included in something that the Bible calls repentance. And repentance is a key part of our sanctification, of our becoming more like Christ. Which is, and it also means repentance is a key part of our righteousness. <laughs> Only we do not feel very righteous when we are owning our sin and our sinful motives. And yet, that is exactly what we do in repentance. Recently, Kathy, he, Kathy told me, that's my wife, <laughs> for those who might not know, Kathy told me something that I had done bothered her. Because as she pointed out, it was thoughtless, self-centered, and made her feel dishonored. And my first reaction was to defend myself. Too often it is, right? But love told me that I needed to admit to her that she was right and ask for her forgiveness. This is what it meant to love my wife. It's what love required. It was the right thing to do. This confession was a kind of righteousness, but I did not feel very righteous doing it. When you own the truth about your sin, you do not feel, feel very good about yourself. But remembering that you belong to Christ and that God accepts you, even delights in you, through Christ, helps a lot. Righteousness can take many shapes and forms. Sometimes they are obvious, such as sharing the gospel out of concern for someone's soul, or preferring and honoring one another, not ourselves, but others, in love. But sometimes, these, our righteousness is not so obvious. Sometimes it comes in shapes and forms that don't look like righteousness, such as putting to death our sinful motives and desires because we belong to Christ. In all these things, it is really not us. It is the love of Christ at work in our hearts. And so one of the best things we can do is to believe and remember how our Lord Jesus loved us. 
how he suffered and died for us, gave himself to us, and how he will come for us, just as he promised. Because then we will be with him in his kingdom. And the last enemy, death, will be no more. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you and thank you for the salvation. It's all your work. And we thank you for that. If there was anything that we had to do, we would not be saved. You save, and you alone. And we thank and praise you for such a great salvation. From the beginning to the end, it's your work. And one day you will finish that work when you come for us and give us a body like your own. And then this war that we have with sin will be over. Our failures will be no more. We will see you and know you and be like you, for we will see you as you are. You are the one who in your glory and holiness love sinners through the cross. Lord, we thank you and praise you, and we ask that you will finish the work you've begun. Keep reminding us and showing us the truth about your love, your righteousness, your salvation. Make us more and more like you by the power that you have to subdue all things to yourself. And we will give you the praise because it's all yours. We pray this in your name. Amen. Let's join together in, in singing uh, a hymn of praise from the Trinity Hymnal 162. It's in your bulletin, Of the Father's Love Begotten. Let's stand and sing.
We'll sing now, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Amen. Sing, hear our praises.
Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you.